want to see how animals eat their food. Watch closely. I know some of you are thinking, yeah, if I was like 19 years old and a dude in college, I would have thought that was funny. But that's where I perpetually live in my mind, so that's, uh, that's why I showed that to you. But I showed it actually to you for another reason as well, because you and I know you can pretend to be something as much as you want, and it doesn't make you that thing, right? The same is actually true when it comes to faith, but sort of uh, in a different way. Oftentimes, you and I will say things that we believe, say who we are in terms of religion or Christianity or spirituality or whatever, but our actions, how we live our life, just doesn't back it up. In other words, the, the proof, you know that old saying, the proof's in the pudding? It's just not there. And for some reason, we call each other on that all the time in other realms of life, right? I mean, everyone knows, no, man, it's gotta, you can't just say this is who you are or whatever. Your actions, how you live, how you, how you walk out relationships with people, that's got to back it up. But for some reason, we let ourselves off the hook all the time, and we let each other off the hook all the time when it comes to faith, We'll say, yeah, I, I believe this, or I'm a Christian, or this, that, and the other. And maybe we don't really live it out. And the Bible actually says, you know what? There's a problem in that scenario. It, it, it's not that there's a problem with people who are asking questions and exploring faith and, and all that and taking the steps. and you know, That's great. But if you say, yeah, me, I'm a Christian, and your life doesn't back it up, the Bible, specifically James, that we're looking at in this series, More Than Words, says... There, there's a bit of an issue there. In fact, we're going to look at a verse real quick. It's the verse that sort of defined this whole series. It's really the verse that defines the letter from James that he wrote to a bunch of dispersed Jewish Christians all around uh, the Middle East some 2,000 years ago, and it's this. James says, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. In other words, you could say you're a Christian, but if you actually don't apply what that means to your daily life, it doesn't really mean anything. Your faith may not be genuine. It may not be real. And James isn't saying that to try to judge someone, try to make someone feel bad, try to put them on the spot, but he wants us to understand. He wants his readers to understand and us today, I believe, to understand that the Christian life was meant to be more than words. There's something else to it. Now, this morning, I want to talk specifically to those of you, and me, I put myself in this boat as well, who say, yeah, I'm a Christian or I'm a churchgoer, or I'm a God person, or whatever, however you want to say it. But yeah, that's me. I want to talk to those of us this morning who say that, who, who put, you know, mark that box, or get in that line, or whatever. If, if that's you, you're who I want to talk to this morning. Now, if that's not you, that's totally fine. And hopefully you know, especially if you've been around I-90 for a while, this is a church. We, we started this church to not just be a place for people who already go to church, not just be a place for people who already say they're Christians. Or for that matter, we didn't start it to be a place only for people who don't go to church or who don't say they're Christians. We believe this church for everyone. We believe every church should be a church for everyone. And if you're not there where you'd say, yeah, I'm in, I'm a Christian, I follow Jesus, whatever, great, ask the questions. Explore, learn, grow. It's a great place for you to do that. But again, for this morning, just for this morning, I wanna address specifically those of you who say, I'm a Christian. Because what James is gonna get at, and he really gets at it in his whole letter, but specifically this morning, this is kind of the heart of, of his whole point. He's going to get at, what does that really mean? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Because it really is something that's just more than words. And here's, here's the big idea. And guys, this, is, uh, this could be the big idea for the series. This really is the big idea for, for life when it comes to Christianity. But it's simply this. When it comes to the Christian life, it's not what you say that proves who you are. It's what you do that proves who you are. 
So we're going to jump right back into where Pastor Chris left off last week in James chapter 2, and it says this. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? In other words, what good is it if you say, yeah, I'm a Christian, that's who I am, and you actually don't live it out? Your actions don't align with what you say is true. He says, what, what good is that? Can such faith save them? In other words, does someone really have what the Bible would refer to as saving faith if they don't live it out? If it doesn't translate into good works? If it doesn't translate into a changed life? I.e., do they really know Christ and have had their sins forgiven as a result if they don't put their faith into action, if they don't obey what God says. If although never perfect, they don't make it their aim, excuse me, never perfect, they don't make it their aim to follow Jesus day in and day out. And it's not that doing good, right things or obeying God is what gets God to love you. That's not what James is saying earns your salvation. James would agree with all the other biblical writers. You're saved through grace. You're saved because of what Jesus has done for you and you receive that gift of grace into your life. But if you really know God and if you've really experienced that saving grace, shouldn't your life look different? Shouldn't a change occur as a result? That's why James is asking that question. Can such faith save them? And then James gives us this example of what he means, and if you've been following along in the series or you've read the book of James on your own or at least just reading the first couple of chapters these past few weeks as we've gone through this series, this example that he'll give you should come as no shock. This shouldn't be something like, oh, wow, I didn't see that coming because James over and over reminds us that one of the things that God says we're supposed to do as followers of Jesus is help those in need. So he's gonna use that as an example here. He says in verse 15, I'm gonna look at it here up on the screen. Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? That phrase, um, be well, be well fed, go in peace, it's actually a prayer that was prayed back in the days when this letter was written as sort of a mantra for when you encountered someone that was in need. It'd be a way to sort of cop out a little bit and say, you know what, I'm going to pray for you. Be well. Be fed. Go in peace. And James is saying, if you encounter someone, a brother or a sister, to use that language, that's in need, I mean like physical, tangible need right by you, and you've got something you could do to help, and your only response is, I'll pray for you, you have a faith issue. There's something that's not lining up between what you say is true about yourself and what really is true about yourself. Yes, it's always good to pray. Absolutely. And sometimes that's all we can do, right? We don't have a, a window here at the church where you drive up and if you, you're sick, you have some kind of illness, something like that, and that's the biggest thing you're asking for, right? Just hand out healings, right? It doesn't work that way. I wish it would, but no, but we pray. We ask the God of the universe who can do big, miraculous things to touch your life. Absolutely. And so sometimes, ultimately, that's all you can do. But if I see a need that I myself can do something about, I mean like right now, I can, I can touch a person's life, I can, I can help someone in their darkest moment, in their deepest need, and I don't do it. James is saying, you know what? You might have a faith issue. Because that's something God asks you to do. And maybe your actions and how you live aren't quite lining up with what you say you believe or is true. Now, in this context, just, just so you understand, James isn't talking about going to far-off lands and digging wells and building homes and sponsoring kids and all that kind of stuff, although we certainly believe in all of that. Very, very important, right? I mean, we, we send a team down every year to Honduras to build a home for a family that's in dire need. We'll continue to do that every year. Hopefully, we'll do that a couple of times next year. Uh, that's something we certainly believe in. But that's actually not what James is getting at. Here, James is talking about those who are right around you. Even more specifically, he's talking about others who are in church with you. Look at what he, what he says. Suppose a brother or a sister, i.e. a fellow Christian, a fellow churchgoer, someone who's in your community of faith, is without clothes 
and daily food. And all you do is say, I'll, I'll, pr- I'll pray for you. Hope thing, I hope it works out, and I'll pray. Now this doesn't, I'm not wacko on this, right? It doesn't mean you have the resources or the ability or it's wise to try to meet every single need that comes your way. We know that's impossible. We know that's not always the healthy thing to do. But James is saying, do you put your faith into action? And as a church, I, just so you guys know, and I, I'm constantly being reminded, I think, by God to um, tell people as you come into this place and learn about who we are and what we stand for and what we're all about, you need to know we're a church that when it comes to those of us who are in the church, those who are part of this faith community, we do whatever we can and we can't do everything, but we do whatever we can to help those in need. Now, it's not that, again, we ignore the stuff going on outside our walls, but that's different. We got to pray for discernment with that. We got to understand what is God leading us to because there's millions of people in the world and there's millions of needs and we can't meet them all. So we say, God, show us those couple of things that we've got the time and the resources and the energy for and we'll focus on those. But when it comes to people in the church, at I-90 Community Church, there's really no doubt that God says, you do what you can to help those in need. In some way or another, that's the goal. Food, clothes, housing, counseling, whatever, prayer. We do what we can to help each other out. It's like one of the biggest marks of being a Christian, of being a church. Sometimes, and I've I've received this kind of uh, help myself, so don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to offend anyone, but sometimes it's just like, hey, you need to manage your money differently so you stop ending up in this mess. Sometimes that's the greatest gift we can give, but whatever it is, whatever is necessary, whatever appropriate, we try to do. And it's because God tells us to do it, and he gives us the compassion, he puts this love in our hearts to obey that command. So James gives us that example, and then he makes the statement that I read at the beginning of the message, and that we've been looking at all series long, and it's this. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Just like a flippant prayer when you could immediately do something yourself really isn't helping someone in need. Faith that's not lived out through obedience to God's commands, according to James, really isn't faith at all. It's not very genuine. It's lacking. It has to produce change, action, transformation. There has to be some kind of evidence. I've been reading this book um, uh, called No Doubt, and no as in K-N-O-W. And it's an interesting read on, uh, from a pastor named John Ortberg on the relationship between faith and doubt as you seek out God in your life. And I'd encourage you to read it, especially if you know someone who's wrestling with those questions of how do I reconcile the doubts I have with growing in my faith, or maybe you're going through that yourself. Um, We all do at some point. This is a great resource for that. But anyway, in this book he says this. Now imagine that two people affirm the Apostles' Creed. Now if you're not if you didn't grow up kind of a in a more mainline denomination where you've heard those terms, the Apostles' Creed was a set of truths that the early church put together to just kind of cover, he, here, these are the most important truths, theological points, doctrines, whatever words you want to use, that we need to stand on. I mean, these are the things that are just absolutely central to the Christian faith. And he says, now imagine that two people affirm those things, the Apostles' Creed. One person is humble, loving, truthful, surprisingly bold, and full of life. And good-hearted people generally find themselves wanting to be around him. The other man affirms the same beliefs, but he is selfish, angry, judgmental, cold-hearted and proud, and he gossips about people. Nobody wants to be around him. Here's the question, and I think James is asking us the same question as well. Do these two people share the same faith? Do they really believe the same things, and if they do, why are they so different? James isn't saying you're going to become a Christian and figure out how to be perfect. It's never the case. We're always human beings. But he is saying, if you've, been cha- if, you, if you've received the grace of God into your life, if you've accepted that free gift, and you say, yeah, I follow Jesus, there needs to be a difference. There needs to be something tangible, something that you can see on the outside. There's got to be evidence. And then like a good chess player, James is always anticipating um, a couple of moves ahead. 
And he anticipates the pushback from some of the churchgoers and Christians he's writing to, and he says this. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. In other words, I know what some of you are going to say. Well, that's just not me. I believe the right things. I go to church sometimes. Heck, I even pray for people, but I'm not one of those, yeah, I serve, I give, I do stuff for needy children, I sponsor children, I tell other people about my faith. That's just not me. I'm not that kind of Christian. It's private, it's quiet, I just keep it to myself. But yeah, I believe. I have, I have faith. You, you're the doer type. You, you put it in action. Okay, great, that's fine, but that's just not, that's not my thing. James knows that when people hear this message, that's what some of them are going to think, how they're going to respond, how they're going to justify how they're not quite living up to what the Bible says. To which James then says, well, that may be true. You may believe, you may ascribe to these things, but you probably shouldn't call yourself a Christian then. You probably should rethink who you are. And then he says, well, show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. In other words, I'll show you evidence of what I believe based on how I live my life. And then he just, he nails us. And guys, I've been there. If you hear these next words, and you're like, ooh, that was uncomfortable. That wasn't the happy fuzzy I was looking for at church today. I've been there, I've heard it, I've had to wrestle through it myself. Verse 19, he says, you believe that there is one God, good. In other words, you, you believe God is real, you believe J Jesus died for you, maybe you even believe Jesus is the only true way to God. That's great, but guess what? Even demons believe that. Now, I don't know where you're at with the whole Satan and demons thing, but we certainly believe the Bible teaches us that there are evil forces that oppose us, right? That are enemies of God. And James is pointing out, you know what? All those things that are true about God that you say you believe, guess what? God's enemies believe those same things. They actually probably know they're more true than you realize how true they are. And they're not followers of Christ, they're his enemies. They know that stuff and it makes them shudder. See, believing something is real. Believing something is true neither means your life is necessarily any different as a result. Who you are, who I am, is proven by what we do. This is the point in the summer. I don't know if any of you guys can relate, or some of you gals too. I know we've got some big uh, sports uh, women here in the church too, but this is the point in the summer where I am just craving NFL football, okay? This Mariner's great. I hope you do well. Keep winning games. Awesome, but give me football, okay? I got to get back to the fall, right? And this is that point in the summer. You're just going to go, ah, please, it's coming. I know that training comes, camp's coming kind of soon, and I know some of you are like, what a dork, but that's just, that's who I am, and I get all excited about it. So this is that point in the summer. When I think back about all the years that I have rooted for the Seahawks, and I'm, I'm not a fair weather fan, right? I was watching the Seahawks when Dave Craig was quarterback and he fumbled every other down and we lost every game like 40 to 10 and we never made it to the playoffs, all that kind of stuff. I've been through it all and I've rooted throughout the whole thing, okay? I would never stand up in front of someone and say, you know what, because I know it, I believe in them, I read the stats, I know the stuff, I'm a Seahawk. I would never do that because I never put on the pads, right? I never go out on the field. We wouldn't have won the Super Bowl if I was out there, right? So, I mean, I am not a Seahawk. But I love them. I cheer for them. I'm a fan. You and I do that with faith all the time. I'm spiritual. I'm a Christian. I'm religious. But we don't put on the pads. We don't get down in the ditch and go through the stuff that God calls us to do that really proves we are who we say we are. Now again, I'm not pointing the finger at anyone because I live there too. But James wants us to know, he desperately wants us to, us to understand the Christian life is more than words. Your faith, which is a gift from God and you are saved by grace, should produce something in you that results in change. Faith without works, faith without obedience, faith without any action isn't real faith at all. And then just to drive it home, James gives us two examples of people from the Bible who we're told had true saving faith. In fact, if you have never read these stories, I'd encourage you to look at them. They, James just gives a little snippets here, but he says in verse 20, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? 
Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Now, if you're new to the Bible, don't know that story, totally cool, but go home and read it. Genesis chapter 22. It's an incredible story, and it will increase your faith when you read it, all right? But James has given us an example of Abraham, this big, you know, character in the Bible. He says it was the same thing for him. It wasn't just, he, it, he wasn't a, a, a lover of God because he said he believed in God. What proved that he was God's follower, God's child, God's representative, was that he put his faith into action. It goes on. You see that his faith and his, and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. In other words, he had saving faith. He trusted in God. He walked out his faith. It was proven that he had accepted that gift in his life because he, he walked it out. He was changed. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. And then he gives us another example. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. If you don't know that story, no big deal. But read it. Joshua chapter 2. Incredible story that shows God can use anyone at any time to accomplish his purposes if we not only say what we believe, we act upon it. We, do, we, put, we put feet to it. Even Rahab the prostitute, great story, Joshua chapter 2, did this. And God did something great through her. And then he concludes this way. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. The Apostle Paul sums up this whole faith and deeds discussion this way in his letter to the Ephesians. I think probably better than any verse, this encapsulates it and, and explains it the best. He says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works or deeds so that no one can boast. In other words, none of us earn our way into God's favor. None of us earn our right to go to heaven. We just accept an offer from God of grace, an offer of love, an offer of forgiveness. And like a Christmas gift, we say, sure, I'll take it. We didn't earn it. We didn't do anything for it. It is absolutely by God's grace. That is the gospel. But for those of us who know God through accepting that gift of grace, there's a part two. That's not the end of the story. Paul goes on. He says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, to obey him, to put our faith into action, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, if you're saved, to use that churchy language, if you're a Christian, you should be changed as a result. See, one of the coolest things about Christianity is that God doesn't save us and transform us just for us. He does it so that we'll walk out the rest of our lives here on earth doing good things by his grace and power so that others would know his grace as well. We're not here any longer just for us. We're here for a bigger purpose. If you really know him, if I really know him, it will show. There will be evidence. The Apostle Paul says it like this, and I want to end with this challenge. It's sobering, it stings a little bit. Again, these are some of the harder truths that we're dealing with this morning, but it, but it is the truth. And we need to receive it, we need to wrestle with it. And remember, I'm talking to those of us who said, me, right? I'm a Christian. I believe. I follow. Well, again, we have to ask the question, really? Is that true? I have to ask the question every day when I get it. Am I going to put this into action? Will there be evidence? Will there be something in my life that people can look at and say, yeah, it's certainly still a goofball and, and not perfect by any stretch of the means, but he's different. He's changed. When I see needs of the people around me, and I don't ignore them, but I try to do something, whatever I can, whatever God would lead me to, but I don't just say, oh, I'll just pray for you. When there's areas of sin in my life that are nasty and gross and they're hurting myself and hurting relationships with other people and hurting my relationship with God, do I say, okay, God, change me, fix me, let's, let's grow together in this thing, or I say, ah, nah, forget it, I'm no big deal. I'm just gonna keep doing what I wanna do. 
Am I changed? Do I hold on to my time and my talents and my treasures for just myself? Or do I live life with open hands day by day and say, God, use it. You gave it to me in the first place. Use it however you want to. Now, we'll never be perfect. Yes, we will still stumble and fall and make mistakes, but is there a growing evidence in our life that we really know God? So this is what John says. 1 John chapter 2. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. I'm going to read that one more time. We know that we have come to know him. In other words, we're a Christian. We have a relationship with God if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, and this will sting a little bit, but take it, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. And this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him, whoever claims to be a Christian, whoever says, I'm in, checks the box, gets in the right line, whatever, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Again, not perfection, not, oh, I got it all figured out, not, there's no single doubts ever left in my mind, but a growing evidence day by day by day that we have been changed by the grace of God. The one example, and this is really cool, you guys, we are in a church, and you need to know this, where this is being lived out. I want to take James' words seriously. I want to reflect on them for my own life. I want to challenge you to do the same, but I also want you to know that it's happening. And there are all kinds of stories I could give you. It, it happens all the time throughout I-9 Community Church, but as I was reflecting on this and thinking, God, I know you want me to share something. I know you want me to be real about how people are putting their faith into action as this church. My mind constantly went back to one story. And some of you are familiar with this. Some of you know this person personally. But one of our staff members here at the church, Sally Kraft, her husband Dan, uh, was diagnosed a couple months ago with colon cancer. And unfortunately, when they made the diagnosis, they also found out that it had spread to a lot of his body. And um, he's got a big, tough battle that he's facing. And I love Dan. I love Sally. They're people I'd do anything for. And I was ready to do anything for him, whatever I had to do. And what's so cool is I didn't have to. You guys beat me to it, and you beat me to it like every day. I talked to someone else in the lobby just this morning who said, yeah, I just finished this little project I was doing for the Crafts Home. I'm so excited that I get to give it to them. So cool, right, that I could give and just help. And it's chores, laundry, cleaning the house, prayer sessions, babysitting for their grandchild, all, on and on and on, all these things where you guys have just said, you know what, we're not going to let our faith be just words. We're going to put it into action. Specifically, James really says, and for those who are in the church, you need to make sure you put it into action for your fellow brothers and sisters. And you guys have done it, and it's awesome. And yeah, it's still a long road that they face, and yeah, we're going to have lots of nights of prayer and, and calling upon God and doing whatever we can. But this is a church that gets it. And I want to challenge you, if you're in that place this morning where you're like, yeah, I've been saying the words, I've been checking the box, but I'm not really living this out. You're missing out. See, this, this message from James isn't like this judgment, condemnation thing. It's a message of life. He wants us to stop and say, am I really experiencing what Jesus came for me to experience? Am I really living the life that, as Jesus would say, is truly life? Or am I just going through the motions? I say the words, I say... We are missing out, you guys, if we don't put our faith into action. Yeah, it's not a judgment thing. It's not a condemnation thing. This is a revelation thing. This is a reformation thing. This is a rebirth thing. And it's awesome. And if you're here this morning, you're like, I need to do it. I need to walk it out. Ask God for help. Ask us for help. And say, no longer will I be okay with my faith just being words. There's got to be something more. So, Jesus, thank you that you sit on the throne, that you love us, that you died for us, that you want us to have new life. God, help us to live it out. And we can only do it by the power of your spirit. We can only do it by your grace. But God, I know that we have to do it. We have to let you take control. We have to take steps of obedience. We have to read your word and pray to you and hear your voice and 
follow. And Father, I pray that this would be a church where people know, God, it's not about words. It's not about checking the box. It's about how we live our lives. Um, Father, I think that's a beautiful thing. I think that's, I think that's what the, um, a world that doesn't know your love and grace is really looking for. Something that's not hypocritical. Something that's not just going through the motions. Something that's real. So Father, thank you for this challenge from James. Thank you that we can put our faith into action. And I pray you would continue to do that in every life here at I-90 for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Guys, thanks for hanging out with us. We'll see you next Sunday.